Today we'll be talking about patent ductus arteriosus, or PDA, by Ashlyn Wesley and Laura. PDA is not referring to a personal data assistant or public displays of affection. Patent ductus arteriosus is a condition in which the fetal ductus arteriosus does not close after birth. Instead of blood flowing normally as it would out of the aorta and into the rest of the body, some of the blood flow is shunted from the aorta, an area of high pressure, into the pulmonary artery, an area of lower pressure. The specific reason for why the ductus arteriosus closes in some infants but not in others is currently unknown, but the disease has been linked to numerous risk factors such as the following. Premature birth has been linked to PDA due to an inadequate amount of time for ductal muscles to mature. Thus, the muscles cannot constrict sufficiently enough to fully close the duct in response to oxygen. Premature infants also have elevated prostaglandin E2 levels, which has a dilatory effect on the duct. In addition, the hypoxemic conditions at high altitudes can interfere with the mechanisms for duct closure. Certain genetic diseases have also been linked with PDA, such as Char syndrome and Down syndrome. Low birth weight can also predispose an infant to PDA. The majority of infants weighing less than 1,500 grams at birth are born with this congenital disorder. And PDA is about twice as common in females than males. PDA can be considered either self-limiting or progressive depending on the individual case. Sometimes it can be a self-limiting disease because the ductus arteriosus may close naturally or some infants may even be asymptomatic. On the other hand, it can also be classified as a progressive disorder in more severe cases because the symptoms associated with PDA may worsen into heart failure if the duct remains open. There are many ways to cure PDA depending on the size and severity of the defect. Some examples of treatment options include a conservative approach, pharmacological intervention, or a surgical repair. We will discuss these in further detail a little bit later, but the main goal with each of these approaches is to ultimately close the ductus arteriosus. The left to right shunting of blood is dependent upon the size and length of the defect and the levels of pulmonary and systemic vascular resistance in the body. For example, the volume and speed of blood flow from aorta to pulmonary artery decreases with a smaller defect and higher pulmonary arterial pressure. If the systemic vascular resistance increases and the defect is larger, there will be a larger flow of blood from aorta to pulmonary artery. In a small defect in shunt, there is not a significant effect on the cardiovascular system. There is an increased risk of infective enteroarteritis when bacteria infect and cause inflammation of the inner lining of the arteries. With a moderate sized duct in shunt, there is a larger volume load on left atria and left ventricle and also may increase volume load on right atria and right ventricle depending on direction of blood flow. This increase in volume may cause dilation and dysfunction of the heart, including possible atrial fibrillation. A large PDA increases the volume load on both atria and ventricles and increases peripheral arterial pressure, or PAP. This rise in pressure causes pulmonary arterial hypertension, or PAH, and increases risk of pulmonary veno-occlusive disease. There is also an increased pressure load on the right ventricle as a result of increased PAP. As a result of the uncontrolled blood flow through the PDA, a patient may experience pulmonary congestion from increased pulmonary blood flow, congestive heart failure from left ventricle dysfunction, or Eisenmenger's syndrome. The shunt reversal associated with this syndrome is a product of the severe PAH and the high PAP that causes more blood to flow from pulmonary artery to aorta. The mixed oxygenated and deoxygenated blood that is sent to the periphery has a lower concentration of oxygen and results in cyanosis of lower extremities and the characteristic clubbing of toes seen in the picture to the right of the slide. Full-term infants born with only a small defect may be asymptomatic. They may also present with a faint systolic murmur, and it is possible for this condition to go undetected throughout childhood and even until adulthood. 
Infants with larger defects will have more noticeable signs and symptoms. They may exhibit a louder, continuous murmur, also known as a machinery murmur. They may have a widened pulse pressure, which is a larger than normal difference in systolic and diastolic blood pressure readings. 120 over 80, a normal reading for an adult, has a difference of 40 millimeters mercury. So a widened pulse pressure would be greater than 40 millimeters mercury. For infants one to six months old, a normal blood pressure is 80 over 46. So a normal difference would be about 34 millimeters mercury, and a widened pulse pressure would be greater than that. Bounding peripheral pulses are another symptom. We talked about this in class, and this would be a pulse that feels stronger than usual, classified as a 4 plus on the pulse rating scales. Infants may also have prominent suprasternal and carotid pulsations, so feeling a strong pulsation under the clavicles and in the neck. Failure to thrive is where a baby is not eating enough and is unable to gain weight normally. This would be when adequate nutrition is available and not due to a lack of food. Abnormal breathing, so the baby may be breathless when eating, crying, or even just when playing with toys. They may be breathing faster than normal, and they may tire easily and have a rapid heart rate. As mentioned earlier, there are many ways to treat PDA, one of which is taking a more conservative approach. This would generally be for infants who are asymptomatic or have only minor shunting of blood. In this approach, the patient is monitored in an optimal environment until the duct closes naturally or monitored to assure that new symptoms do not arise. They can also be given diuretics to alleviate the extra strain put on the heart by left to right shunting. A second approach is a pharmacological intervention. This treatment is especially utilized for patients with respiratory distress syndrome. The two medications administered are endomethacin and ibuprofen. These are both cyclooxygenase inhibitors. They work by suppressing the production of prostaglandin E2, which is a vasodilator that promotes ductal patency. An alternative treatment for infants who do not respond to three doses of the cyclooxygenase inhibitors or who have more severe cases of PDA is using catheterization to close the ductus arteriosus. In this approach, a catheter is inserted into a blood vessel in the groin, usually the femoral artery, and guided towards the heart. The catheter is used to position a coil or any other type of closure device to occlude the ductus arteriosus and prevent further blood flow through this vessel. It is typically done as an outpatient procedure. Surgical closure of the ductus arteriosus is an alternative if catheterization is not feasible. The procedure requires a thoracotomy to expose the patent ductus arteriosus. Then, there are several options to close the duct, which include the use of clips, placing a ligature on the pulmonic and aortic ends of the duct, or placing two sutures on the duct before dividing it. An additional recommendation for patients with PDA is to practice good dental hygiene. Patients with PDA are at higher risk for infective endocarditis, which can be caused by bacteria that colonize teeth. There are no PT interventions indicated specifically for PDA, but it is recommended for patients to exercise regularly if they don't have PAH. If a patient has a small PDA or corrected PDA, they have no exercise restrictions as long as they do not have PAH or left ventricle enlargement. If a patient has PAH and or left ventricle enlargement, vitals should be monitored and there are few precautions to consider. For PAH, oxygen saturation and heart rate should be monitored by a pulse oximeter throughout exercise. The therapist should make sure supplemental oxygen is used or on standby in case the oxygen saturation is low. The therapist should check with the patient during exercises to see if they become dizzy from decreased oxygen perfusion. These patients will have a reduced exercise capacity, so the therapist should begin with low-intensity exercise and then build from there. Exercising has been shown to improve functional and exercise capacity of PAH and should be utilized. If a patient has left ventricle enlargement, the therapist should monitor dyspnea resulting from higher PAP using the Ranchos Los Amigos Dyspnea Scale. 
Heart rate should also be monitored in case the patient is experiencing decreased diastolic function and cardiac output from rigidity of the left ventricle. Symptoms can become exacerbated during strenuous exercise and may result in sudden death. Therefore, it is very important to monitor vitals throughout treatment and begin with low-intensity exercise. That's our presentation. Thanks for watching it, guys. Hope you learned something.